Well, the sermon this morning is entitled Living for Jesus Today. Living for Jesus Today. We're going to be looking in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, and uh, a couple of other verses or so in Matthew uh, as well. They, ne they won't necessarily be up on the screen, so you may have to uh, become familiar with the Gospel of Matthew and look up some of that stuff uh, with me as I go through this. But first off, we want to look at Matthew 5, 38 through 41, as kind of our uh, keynote uh, verses here, three, four verses uh, that we're going to play off of for most of the sermon. So if you have a copy of God's Word and want to turn there, that's fine. But if we can, let's stand in honor of God's Word as I read aloud. You have heard it. Uh, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other uh, cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. You may be seated. And we're going to kind of zero in on that last verse, verse 41. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two. It's a small verse with some immense implications. Immense implications. In Jesus' day, this, is, this was a requirement of the law. A Roman soldier could compel a citizen of the area to go with them one mile anywhere. Uh, it didn't matter your age or your physical ability. You were forced to go. Uh, I would imagine if uh, you decided you weren't interested in going, you might be interested in dying. Because it was, it was that blunt. So it was a requirement of the law and uh, it was known, it was understood. But talk about a law that would not be followed today. <laughs> How about the speed limits here? Um, sometimes you're going down Herndon and it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Usual joke in my, when we're driving is, I'm not going fast enough. I don't know what my problem is, but I'm not going fast enough. Everybody keeps passing me. And, and if you're going down 99, I'm not sure where people are going, um, but highway patrol is not altogether around, because they're, they're sure going. It seems that many think the limits are a suggestion. Suggest Any other laws that seem like a suggestion to you? Cross at the crosswalk. Stop. Now this, you know, there are all sorts of laws that don't have anything to do with driving, you know. What, what are some other laws that seem like a suggestion to people? Don't litter. Watering. Okay. What other, any other laws that might get in there? Okay, okay. Well, the idea of uh, texting and driving. Uh-oh, uh-oh, some people. <laughs> you know, there are all sorts of laws that are out there that people seem to, seem to think it's a suggestion. Maybe the folks think they're the exception to the law. You know, that the law doesn't apply to them or shouldn't apply to them somehow. However, we have no rule to walk with anyone anywhere, much less to carry their pack or their purse or their problems. We don't have such law, such law. Oswald Chambers, in regards to this verse in specific, shares that the relationship Jesus demands of us is an impossible one unless he has done a supernatural work in us. 
unless God has done a supernatural work in us, his expectations are just impossible. Now, there'd be a lot of people who say, oh, God supernaturally saved me. I'm not talking about saving you. I'm talking about how you walk every day. Are you living for Jesus every day? We'll get into it a little bit more. Being saved and walking with the, with the uh, master are kind of like two different things. Uh, you can be a Christian and walk by yourself, don't you know? Do your own thing your own way for your own reasons. But anyway, this is an interesting thought, at least to me, is that supernatural work. Because it changes who we are. Not who we've always been, but who we are and potentially who we will be. Because if, if life were just lived by who we are, you'd have a bunch of selfish pinballs going every which way. Not relating to one another, just doing their own thing. If we are to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, it must be done supernaturally. Another thought that he threw in there. Becoming a disciple of Jesus Christ doesn't happen because you come forward or, or because you're baptized. It happens because God's Spirit gets in us and changes us. And some of us don't want to be changed. And that's been true since we came into this world. Amen? Any of you cry whenever you got changed? And you sit there and you say, I wouldn't know. I didn't know either until the first church I served in was the same church I was born in. And some of the ladies came up to talk to me that they had changed me. And I still was crying when it was back then. <laughs> Who knew? I was a little guy, so I didn't know about that crying stuff. But they told me for sure and for a fact I was crying. I, I cried. Well, I didn't want to be changed. And I, I would say that a good number of them here don't want to be changed either. Because... Verse 41 is not natural to us. Going the second mile doesn't come naturally to any of us. Now, if it's for ourselves, boy, we'll go the third, fourth, eighth mile, 22 miles. This is not for us. This is for someone else because we have been compelled you see, God doesn't build on our natural capacities. He doesn't ask us to do things we do well or do easily. He asks us to do stuff that, Lord, I, that's kind of hard. Lord, I'm not real good at that. Does that bother God? Not in the least. Why? He's trying to stretch us. He's trying to build us. He's trying to make of us something powerful, useful in his hands. And folks, truly, it will be, as we talked about last Sunday, it will be by his grace that we will be able to bear up, to carry the load, to approach whatever he brings our way. It'll be by his grace, not by any endeavor on our part. Is there a law about how we are to relate to others? And it is. Do unto others. As you would have them do unto you. Not exactly. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. I'll, I'll underline why that's the law. Because it's the second is likened to the first. When you get it in first, second. The first is to love the Lord thy God with thy heart, thy mind, thy soul, thy strength. And to love your neighbor as you love yourself. So that's the law. But how does that play out in, our, in the everyday? Your neighbor comes up, what do you say? Beat it! Get out of here! Do you say that? You see your neighbor coming. Could we go somewhere quickly? We've got to get out of here. Well, probably you don't. What are God's expectation of his children and how they're supposed to relate to others? What are God's expectations 
and how his children are to relate to others. They're to relate to others out of love. That's the modus operandi. That's the medium through which God is going to care for others. Where God is going to, how God is going to meet verse 41. Because that's not going to be our natural tendency. We have a natural tendency not to exactly want to be bothered. So in the first mile, we are to relate to others out of love. How about thereafter? Continue. But haven't you ever heard somebody say, well, I did the first mile. Okay, well, you did the first mile. Good for you. In Jesus' day, now you may sit there and say, I can't imagine. In Jesus' day, they had the mile measured. This is their house. And they had a mile in whatever direction the road went. And when they got to the mile, they dropped the pack. I'm done. Wouldn't that be human nature? I'm going to do what I have to do as long as I have to do it. And then I ain't going to do it no more. So they had the mile measured if the road went this way. They had a marker out there somewhere. And they, that mile's up, buddy. <laughs> Here's your pack. Here's your need. Now you sit there and say, you wouldn't have Christians today who, who, uh, who would only do so much for only so long? Well, I don't know, would you? Well, <clears throat> is there a point beyond which you will not relate in a Christ-like fashion to others? Is there a point beyond which you will not relate to others in a Christ-like fashion? Peter asked Jesus how many times he must forgive his brother. You ever remember that one? In Matthew 18, verse 21 and 22, Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times. And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to seventy times Seven. Sounds kind of indefinite, doesn't it? For as long as you need to do it, you need to do it. But Peter's asking the question, if there's a measure by which to be measured, me doing what I should do, as, and, and really, seven times was being extremely gracious in that day and hour. And yet Jesus just opened up the barn door and said, not seven times, but 70 times seven. And yet, it's not a specific number. It has nothing to do with a specific number. It has everything to do with acting out of love. Acting out of love. In my Bible, there's a note in the margin that says, the spirit of forgiveness has no boundaries. The spirit of forgiveness has no boundaries. But you know, we at times like to put boundaries on loving our neighbor as ourselves. Does that make sense? We like to put boundaries on loving our neighbor as ourselves. Or we like to put boundaries on forgiving our neighbors as we have been forgiven. Or we like to put boundaries on going the second mile. We like boundaries. You know, it's kind of, you know, give me an assignment, it goes for this long, and then beyond that, I don't have to care. I have to worry. Because the first mile, you know, sometimes people said, I, I, at, that second mile stuff gives me difficulty because the first mile was so uncomfortable. The first mile was so unfair. The first mile was so embarrassing. The first mile was so frustrating, so hurtful, so you fill in the blank. 
there's a reason that the first mile was terrible and I don't want to go a second mile. So I'm the exception, aren't I? So I can go 60 miles an hour down Herndon. You know, there's, there's some times that people, if you're gonna, if you're gonna get caught on Herndon, put, it, put the pedal to the metal. You know, it was going 90. Where's the fire? Well, at the first of this passage, it says, you have heard it, that it is said, or has been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Doesn't that kind of sound like a measure? Sound, I mean, and that kind of appeals to people. It does. It kind of appeals to people. But what has Jesus said? You've heard it said, but hear it. But listen to what I'm going to tell you. But I'll tell you this. Do not resist an evil person. If one slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other. So first off, he's talking about getting slapped. Then he's talking about getting sued. And there's no conversation about retaliation. No retaliation. He's talking about a new way of living. A new way of living that does not act like the old. Is not unseemly. But is very much godly. So there's no retaliation that's, that's brought up there. Instead, really what Jesus said, instead... If forced, in others it says, if compelled, go. If compelled, go. See, in, in our day, if we had it to it, you know, somebody comes up and says, I need for you to do thus for me, you'd say, here's money. This didn't involve money. There had been probably a lot of people, I'll pay so-and-so to, to carry your pack. No, you're going to carry it. And it was like, oh, I don't have to. I'm the mayor. You were the mayor. You say, they wouldn't do that. Folks, a Jew was expendable. They did not matter. The only people that matter were Roman soldiers. Or a Roman. So, you will carry it. Or somebody else will, but you will not be here to be bothered by that. So if compelled, go. Don't just go the measure, but go the second mile. When I was looking in my Bible for, you know, other corroborating information, I looked under the word compelled. And the scripture talked about one who had come from the country who was compelled. And his name was Simon. And he was compelled to what? Carry the cross. If any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. But I thought it was interesting because I said, I don't want to do this. I came here with my children. I don't have time for this. Uh, you will not have time if you do not carry this cross. It wasn't a question about whether he would or wouldn't. It was whether he wanted to live or whether he didn't want to live. He said, well, that's pretty violent. Well, here's an opportunity to go to the second mile. Will we? If we truly love God, there will be that in there. Ha have any of you e ever gone the second mile for your children? Hello? Anybody in here gone the second mile for their grandchildren?
for their extended family? I, we know the concept. We like to apply its application in our life. Children, okay, grandchildren, extended family. This, this is indiscriminate. This is as God would bring it about. As God would bring an individual, a situation your way. You know, I, I think you, Jesus here, if you will, is enlarging, ask us to enlarge the casting of our net. Now some of us, uh, some out here may know about net, uh, fishing with a net. Um, I know whenever we were, uh, I was fishing like, uh, with my uh, father-in-law down in uh, Louisiana, we'd have, a, we'd have a bait net. And it was about like this from here to the ground, it was like seven foot tall, and it had weights down here. And the first oh, couple of times we went out in the boat, You'd try to catch bait with that, because that's what it said on the box, that you, that you could catch bait with that net. And, you know, you'd grab it like this and kind of throw it. Well, my nets were usually this kind of net, you know, the kind that you got the fish on the line. and you, So I didn't understand anything about that, and he'd look at me, throw that net. He was driving the boat because I didn't know how to drive the boat, so I was trying to drive the net. Well, you, this net would go out like this and go kerplunk. And he'd say, now, Daryl, you're going to have to widen the cast of your net just a little, a little bit. And he'd come up and try to show me what, what it was, and I got better at it. But what you're trying to do, because you're holding a line that's attached to the top of the net, and you're trying to let that line go out at the time you're throwing that net, and you want it to go out 15, 20 feet. And you say, well, what was the point of that? Because the fish weren't like right there. The fish that you were after, little bait fish, were out of ways. So you'd get there. Well, I got pretty good at it. And 15, 20 feet out there, the net would enlarge out to 9 feet. It would drop. The weights would come together. And you could, you could get some bait fish. But he'd always say, Daryl, you're going to have to enlarge the, the cast of your net. Because this casting out where it just stays together in a wad and goes, doesn't work. I think Jesus is saying that sometimes Christians cast their net for others, but there's not much opening. The measure that they give is a measure of one mile. And, and they know when that mile is up and they're not doing anything further. They're not doing anything further, not because they can't, but because it might be an inconvenience to go the second mile. So Jesus here is asking those who are listening to enlarge the cast of their net. Now, sometimes as Christians, ones will say, well, you know, I'm doing my part. Really? Really? How about your actions? Because so oftentimes the actions reveal the character of if you will, of how close we're walking with the Lord. Let's look at those next couple of verses. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Pretty direct, isn't it? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even the pagans do that? So he's putting the ways of the world right next to the ways of a Christian. And if this looks more like the Christian way, because we've walked the second mile with children and grandchildren and extended family, we have done absolutely nothing. We've, do, we've done what was expected. What was easy for us, made sense to us. But what about that second mile? We haven't got there yet. You say, well, I do, you don't know my children. Folks, it doesn't really matter. You're responsible for them. And one day they'll be responsible for you. But the reality is, 
if you only love those who love you. How many of you ever heard, I'll love you if you love me? That's kind of like not <clears throat> love. That's quid pro quo. That's what that is. Well, he says, okay, the ways of the world are like this. Even the pagans care about their own. Let's break that mold. Let's get on out beyond that, that portion. Well, <clears throat> so he's saying, what reward have you? Well, folks, if we have in mind the royal law that's brought out in the book of James, that when we are confronted by a situation uh, of this nature, we won't be caught off guard. In James chapter 2, verse 8, the royal law is mentioned. And what is the royal law? Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Is that kind of an echo? Here, this is in Matthew, and here in James, the royal law. It's identified in almost any translation as the royal law. God's law. Okay, God's law. But you see, if we have that in mind already, that that's how we get through life, into life, beyond life, based not upon what the world does, but of loving your neighbor as you love yourself. I found that if uh, our hearts have been uh, tendered, we become a whole lot more moldable to the master's hands and to the needs and to the requests of others. If we become tendered. Has anyone ever walked the second mile with you? No family. Get rid of them. They don't matter. Somebody who didn't have to. Anybody ever walk the second mile with you? Maybe through the valley of the shadow of death? Or maybe through the valley of tears as is brought out in Psalm 84, 6? The valley of Baca? Or maybe the valley of injustice was where they walked with you. There's something kind of different when somebody else will be willing to walk with you. Did any of these folks stop at the first mile marker? What did that mean to you personally? I'm not asking this in general. I'm asking this in specific. What did it mean when they didn't stop at the first mile marker but kept right on walking? What did it mean? Oh, I want a verbal response. It was a blessing. It was a blessing. Thank you. Someone else? They cared. What else? They held me up all the way. Held you up all the way. Help and kept you going, felt love. What else? You're not alone. alone. Okay. The reason I'm asking is because it can be assumed, but so oftentimes it needs to be heard. We live the Christian life too awful, too awfully much of the time in assumption. Well, I'm sure everybody cares about others. You are mistaken. I'm sure anybody would go the second mile for anybody. I know you are <laughs> mistaken. I don't have time for this. I don't have the energy for this. You're, you're an inconvenience to me. Yeah, you're an inconvenience to somebody else too. Oh, I guess I am. Well, when someone has walked with you, it has a personal effect and at times... It's kind of close to the vest, but others need to know 
that that mattered. Because truthfully speaking, it tendered you to care about somebody else. For with the same comfort we have been comforted with, we would seek to comfort others. Look up in 1 Corinthians, talks about that. And sometimes people haven't been comforted. And so they're kind of broad-shouldered and bristle-backed. And they, oh, I, don't, I don't need any of that help. Really? Sound like you need it. Somehow the mile marker when those who were walking with us, it came and it went. And they were still there. Somehow during that second mile, there are opportunities that don't, don't uh, come forth in the first mile. And if you'd stopped at the first mile, the second mile's opportunity would not appear. Actually, in the second mile is where ministry and message merge. In that second mile is where ministry and message merge. They become one. Because oftentimes people have a message, but it is disconnected from their ministry. You know, we're full of words. Maybe that's just me. But we got this message, and when the ministry and the message get together and merge, as the old saying goes, now we're cooking with gas. Oh my goodness. Now we can do something. Now God can get some leverage in a life, in a situation that wouldn't have been there. You know, I believe Jesus knew this. That's why he said it. But I also believe that Jesus practiced this. I think he waited outside the carpenter shop as the Romans came by. Hey, pick me, pick me, hey, pick me, pick me. You say he didn't do that? Oh, I think he did. I think he sat up there as a strong Jewish man. Hey, you carry my pack. And he carried it the mile. And then he went on. And in that second mile... He had conversations with people, and they were never the same. They were just simply never the same. And I believe that though at times we are exhausted and maybe exasperated, if we'll hang in there, God will help us to bear the load that he's about to place on us because he has been doing a supernatural work in our life. If we've been allowing that relationship that we have with him to grow and to become what it needs to, he'll load us up. Oh, he'll load us up. There's a lot of people who look real strong, but their middle name is Wimpy, Wimpy, Wimpy. <laughs> Why? Because they haven't allowed God to do that work that needs to be done deep, deep down inside. So we need to seek what God might be trying to say and wait for God to reveal what he's up to. It could be very appealing to any of us to give in to pain, to give in to problems, even to give in to pity. I mean, it, it's very appealing to give in, give out. But Jesus, as I've said, is trying to establish a new way of living. And living isn't singing songs. Living is going down the second mile with a song in your heart. And the, and the notion of, of uh, um, how you go about doing it... I, I, there's no, there's no parameters, and there's no measurements. Keep the measurement thing, put it, lose it, lose it, forget it. You don't need to measure it. If it should have taken an hour, but it's three hours, thank God for the ability to stand in the three hours and, and be a, an instrument of his peace or to be a listening ear, whatever it may be. But I think the idea is 
God is seeking to establish a new way of living that goes beyond a service situation here to actually a service situation out there where ministry and message merge and all of a sudden people aren't any longer talking to you. They're talking to the Lord Jesus who lives in you. And through your life, they are able to come to a realization of what God would want to do in and through their life. And what's interesting, at least to me, about this passage is that it follows on the heels of Matthew 1 through 12, 15, which are called Matthew 5, 1 through 12, 15, the Beatitudes. You say, Beatitudes? Yeah, the Beatitudes. <laughs> He's just underlining a further Beatitude here. And you might sit there and say, what do you mean the Beatitudes? Anybody know what I'm... Blessed are the poor, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. All those blesseds. And now he's saying, oh, and by the way, you want to get blessed? Let's go back to the other uh, verses. Go the second mile. Go the second mile. So, life which is being lived for the master is no longer lived by the measure, but by the master. Would he go the second mile for you? Did he go the second mile for you? I believe he did. Some of you, maybe three or four. Well, anyway. Jesus broke out of the mold of the world where he said, even the pagans do that. That's, no one's impressed with that. So Jesus broke out of that mold and challenges us as well. Now he broke out of that mold so that he might cradle our life in his love. So that then we would be willing to take his love on the first mile or even on the second. Having then set the example, he calls us to drop our measuring instruments. Well, you know, I, I really need to go. Uh, I, I can't stay much longer. <laughs> and he also asks us to drop our difficulties. And he then says, spontaneously, would you take up the charge of going beyond the usual? and of walking in my footprints. Will we be willing to walk in the footprints of the Master? Let's pray. Lord, I just pray that there would be a willingness, even in these moments, to come, to realize that, Lord... That supernatural work that is being spoken of here, maybe I've been sitting on it, trying to hold it back, keep it away. But Lord, you want to accomplish great things in each life that's here. And each life that is here can make a great difference in someone else's life. For your honor and for your glory and for the kingdom. There's a royal law out there of loving others as we love ourselves and I know we love ourselves we'll do for ourselves on the right and on the left oh Lord will we do for you for you did for us you went beyond the second mile all the way up the hill even to Calvary Lord that we might be willing to go as needed for your sake and for the kingdom. Lord, I don't know exactly what all it will mean, but I know that 
as long ago you talked about that things happen and there's no need to retaliate but there is a need to step up to bear the burden to go beyond the usual Lord I pray that our love this day might be for you and that we might be willing to get south out of the way to do your bidding in all things and I pray this in the name of Jesus Amen I'll be down here in the front for those that need